Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's stand. Let's stand and let's bow our hearts to the Lord. Father, we are grateful for another day, Lord God. You've given us, Lord, to praise you and give you thanks and to honor you, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, that we can gather together in the name of Jesus, Lord God, and you have a plan for today, Lord. We want to be in your complete plan, Lord. So we open our hearts to you this morning, Lord, and we ask that you would have your way, Lord God. Pray for our time of praise and adoration, Lord God. May you be the center of our worship. May you be glorified through us, Lord. Pray for our worship team. We ask for your full anointing upon them, Lord God, that they'd Father, bring us into your presence and your love, Lord. Bless each one that's here this morning, Lord, like only you can, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song, for the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Sing, 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 and make music with a heaven. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that. it is to give him glory. Let's take a minute or two and uh, share his love with someone. Say hello. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring him an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and I will praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have 
not much to offer you, not near what you deserve. But still I come because your cross is placed in me, my worth, oh Christ, my King of sympathy, whose wounds secure my peace. Your grace extends to call me friend, your mercy sets me free. And I know I'm weak, I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name, but because of grace, because of your mercy, I stand here unashamed. can't explain this kind of love I'm humbled and amazed that you'd come down from heaven's heights and greet me face to face and I know I'm weak I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name Here I am at your feet in my brokenness complete. Here I am at your feet in my brokenness complete. Father, I always think it's amazing that we can stand in your presence, not because of who we are, but because of what you have done through your son, Jesus. I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, this morning that by the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, that you would, Father, give us understanding and knowledge that we would know you in a deeper way personally, Lord God. That you, through the word of God, would speak to us, Lord, but not only speak to us, work deeply within us, Lord God. Cut away things that need to be cut away. Give us, Father, what you would have us to know, Lord, in these days that we live. Bless your people, Lord God, through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. We're glad you're here this morning. We 
We want to rock, welcome Ron and Lori back. They, Ron has, they're in the corner of it. I don't want to embarrass you, so please don't. We love you guys and we missed you. And we have been praying for you for se seven months solid that we know of, and more than that. But we're just glad that you're back and that God is faithful to you as he's been. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we want to welcome you back. Let's go to the book of Acts this morning. We are in the book of Acts. Chapter 1, we are starting a brand new book, the book of Acts. And our text today, our verses, are, is 1 through 14, Acts chapter 1, 1 through 14. Let's read that. Are you all there? You all? The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria unto the utter ends of the earth. So... When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven." Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with their women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. For those of you who are kind of new, we want to remind you of what we do here at Calvary Chapel. We just finished the book of John, the Gospel of John. We went from start on chapter 1, and we finished on chapter, what is the last chapter? 21. And now we're starting in the book of Acts, and we'll continue in the book of Acts until we're completely done with the book of Acts. So we want you to learn about line upon line, precept upon precept, about the whole, the whole scripture, everything that God said, not missing anything. At times it's uncomfortable to go into things that, that are uh, skipped over normally, but today and what we do here at Calvary is we go through every scripture. Now, I'm going to have to give you, ask for you to give me your attention. I know you already are giving me your attention, but look at me. I want to share with you something very important concerning the effects of the Bible that once had on our nation and the value of the Bible today for us individually, for our families, and for our church. On June 17th, 1963, the Bible and the teachings of the Bible were removed from our schools. The reason given by the Supreme Court was this. 
I quote, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the children. Soon after that, the Supreme Court ruled on the removing of the Ten Commandments. And here is a reason why, and I quote again, if the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have effects on all, it will be to induce the school children to read, to meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and obey the commandment, which is not permissibly objective. So after the Bible and the Ten Commandments was removed, something very eye-opening happened in our nation. Something that has affected you and me and many that we love and continue to affect our nation. If you're my age, if you're over 40 years old, I'm over 40, that's not what I'm saying. You can see, especially in the last 10 years, the last five years, especially in the last two years, our nation deteriorate like it's never deteriorated before. And sometimes we look for answers or we look for things that we think are going to help, but they're really not the answers that we need. Let me read some things to you that have happened so far concerning our nation since the Bible was taken out of schools. Birth rates among unwed mothers have drastically changed. Today, more children are being born out of wedlock. In other words, they're not being married. They're having children outside of being married. There's more children born now outside of wedlock. Since 1962 to 1963, it has increased every year since. Kids ages from 10 to 14 having children has increased multiple. Sexual transmission disease has climbed in the greatest number than ever. Today there are 10 sexual diseases that are incurable. You catch them, from then on, they're going to either kill you or you're on medicine for the rest of your life. Parental sexual activity has increased dramatically. Parents divorcing, divorcing has also skyrocketed. Unmarried couples living together has gone straight up the charts. They were all stable before 1962 to 63. Before that, you never even heard of a divorce. When I was growing up, I never heard of people getting divorced. Violent crime surpasses the population growth. As you know, violent crimes is at an all-time high. You see it on your news constantly, don't you? SAT tests, since 1962 to 1963, our scores continue to decline. Scores are so low, although they take the same SAT tests as my generation, your generation, but the scores are 80 points lower today. With all the technology and all the wisdom they're supposed to have, all the knowledge that is accessible to us on the internet, we are dumbing down. But America is number one in the world in these. Violent crime, divorce, teenage pregnancy, voluntary abortions, illegal drug use, illiteracy, alcohol, and the list goes on and on. We're number one. I tell you this because I want you to know the importance and the power of the Word of God. When it is neglected, what happens to us personally and nationally? The Word of God teaches us to deal with the heart before the crime is committed. Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you have committed murder. So he works in our hearts and he tells us to forgive. He nips it in the bud before it grows. Jesus said, if you lust in your heart for someone, 
You have committed adultery. He will have us to deal with that lust before it commits, one commits adultery. And I can tell you, if you've been a Christian for a period of time, every one of you have to say this to me, Pastor, God has dealt in my heart in some way or another that has stopped me through the Word of God from sinning. I cannot tell you how many times the Word of God has popped up in my heart or in my mind or God has brought the Word of God and said to me, Stop. Amen. He's already prepared me so I wouldn't do certain things. And He's done the same thing in every single one of you as a Christian. If you cannot control the heart, you cannot control the crime that in which the Bible is so important. I'm going to say that again. If you cannot control the heart, you can't control the crime. And that is why the Bible is so important, beloved. We are to use the Word of God for our standard. No nation can be blessed without godly principles. I cannot tell you how important it is to let the Word of God have its way in your heart. So you won't be part of the problem, but you'll be part of the answer or the solution. That's how it works. I know that we have seen so much crime. Murder is going crazy in all of the big, our big cities. And they're trying to find the answer. Let's get more police. We need more police. I'm not saying we don't need more police, that's for sure. But our problem is a heart problem, beloved. And God is the only one through the Word of God that can change that heart and prepare the heart to deal with things such as this kind of crime. Amen. Now, let's go to our study today, the book of Acts. Whenever we start a new book, and that's what we're doing today, I believe that there are certain things you need to know that will help you to understand the Scripture. Such as, first of all, who's the author? The author of all Scripture, first of all, is the Holy Spirit. Every time I grab this book, and this isn't the one I usually grab, I use this book because it's big letter, it has big letters. <laughs> so I bring that, this is my Sunday Bible. But I have my little red Bible that I read constantly. And every time I look at this book, I say this. This is God's word. This is God's word to man. It's unfallible. It doesn't make mistakes. It has everything that I need for life. And listen to what Timothy says, for godliness. When I go need answers, I go to this book. And you may say in your mind today, well, I don't believe that that's the only place you can get answers. Let me tell you, if anything goes against this word, that you get answers, they're wrong. The Bible teaches that the author of Scripture is the Holy Spirit in 2 Timothy 3.16. Listen to what it says. All, underline that in your Bibles, all Scripture is given by inspiration, and it means God breathed. God breathed the Word of God out. All Scripture is given by inspiration, God breathed of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every good work. So the author, first of all, is the Holy Spirit of this book that we're going to study. But there's a physical instrument that is used to write this book. His name is Luke. He's also the man who wrote the book of Luke. He was a physician. He cared for Paul during the illnesses. He suffered on his missionary journey. He was a faithful companion to Paul. In fact, Luke was the only companion that was left before Paul was beheaded in Rome. He never deserted Paul. He was a man that was faithful. The time of the writing of this book is about 60 to 64 AD. Now, 
The book of Acts is mainly the study of the early church. We will see some of the great acts God brought forth through men and women of God. Vessels that were filled with God's Spirit and who were led by God's Spirit, and men and women who brought glory to God. With that being said, we need to go into God's Word now. It says, verse 1, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. I'm going to read a different translation to you. This is the New Living Translation. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, this uh, former book that is talking about here is the Gospel of Luke that L Luke is speaking of. At one time, the Gospel of Luke and the book of the Acts were joined together as one book with two volumes. Let's look at this man who's named Theophilus. His name means a friend of God. Who is this man? Some believe that he once was Luke's master. In those days, people had slaves, and they were white, every color every nationality. In fact, the majority of Rome, which was a huge empire, over 60% were slaves. And many believe that Theophilus was a slave, I'm sorry, yeah, Theoph that Luke was a slave to Theophilus, and that he, his master, had got saved, Theophilus, And he decided that he was going to, because Paul led him to Christ, let Theophilus, I'm sorry, let Luke <laughs> go with Paul to take care of him because he was ill and because he was sick. Some believe that there really was no Theophilus. And his name comes from two Greek words, Theos and Phileo, Theos is God and Phileo is lover, well, that Luke is writing to all the lovers of God. I personally believe that there was a man named Theophilus. But I like the idea that the books were written to all of those who are lovers of God. So raise your hand this morning if you are a lover of God. Okay. So he's writing to you this morning. But let me touch on that just a moment. We all have people that are in our lives that are very special to us. It should be our wives if we are husbands. It should be our husbands if, it's, if we are wives today. If we have children, we should love them. If we have grandchildren, we should love them more. <laughs> I'm only kidding. If my sons were here, they would look at me differently. But there are people that we have in our lives that we are to love and especially show love. And the Bible teaches that the person that we are to love first is God, number one. And that our relationship with God affects every single relationship we have in life. So if I have a relationship with you this morning, my relationship with God affects that. That's how it works. And I believe that God is personal Let me share with you how personal, and I hope I don't lose track where I'm at. Last night after I went to bed, my first thing is, when I pray, as I lay in my bed, I say this to God, I love you, God. 
And this is my second thing I said last night, and I don't know why I said it, but I understand in a way, because I think God answered me real quickly. And I said this to God, I don't know how they get out along without you, God. How do they make it? Because I was thinking about things that are happening in our world at that time. And God answered me just like that. And he said this, they don't make it, they exist. And I felt so bad in the sense of, I felt bad for people. But we're talking about, again, the loving God, lovers of God. So let me ask this question to you. Don't answer it, but in your mind and in your heart, when was the last time that you said to God that you love him? Don't have the attitude or the bondage of saying, God knows I love him. I don't have to tell him I love him. I just know that he knows it already. He knows my heart. Imagine a husband who says, never says, I love you to the wife. The wife, they say, our women are made in the sense of their emotions more. They're more emotional. That's not a bad thing. God made them that way. And they need to hear that they're loved by, their, by a man, by their children, whoever it may be. They need to hear that. You may think, well, it doesn't really matter. God needs to hear the same thing. And God doesn't have an ego. God doesn't say, oh, you know, you need to tell me that, you know. That's like a, <laughs> it should come automatically. Now, we should express our love to God by telling them that we love him. But let's go a little further than that. We may say that we love God, that we, but do we keep God's commands concerning loving God? The Bible says this, literally, if you love me, then keep my commands. In other words, the expression of God's love is what I do concerning what God commands me to do. And literally, it's very simple. I've written these on my own heart, and I wore them as a necklace, the Bible says, to do that, truth and mercy. But it's to love God and to love people. It's very simple. And you'll fulfill all the commandments of God. So God wants us to be lovers of his, not in just word, I love you, God, but also in my actions, the expression of love in what I do concerning God's command and what I do concerning people. That's how it works. So let me ask you this question. No answer. How much does your life express that you love God? Now, the Bible teaches here in the second part of these verse, this verse, and Luke writes, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach, the key word in this passage part of the scripture is begun. Gospel according to Luke is not the full story of ministry of Jesus Christ. It is only the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus continues to minister to the needs of people Jesus continues to heal the sick today. Jesus continues to raise the dead. Jesus continues to minister his love and his gospel to the world. And now he is ministering through those disciples who have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. But the ministry of Christ is continuing. Now because of that, the Acts of the Apostles is an unfinished book. In that, the Lord today continues to work through the lives of those who have dedicated themselves to be instruments of God, to be led and guided and anointed by the Holy Spirit, to continue the ministry of Jesus to this day to the world. Now, raise your hand if God has used you some way or another to pray for someone, to minister some way or another, that God has used you. Raise your hand if God is in the last two weeks or a day 
You see, those are the acts that are continually happening, and they're going to happen until the Lord returns and takes his church home. Until that happens, there are acts. God is still working by his Holy Spirit. God still speaks. God still fills people with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, as we will see. But the works of God are still happening in yours and my life. If I pray for God to change something in my life, I expect God to change that. God's still working. He lives in me, as we will see in just a moment. Don't think the book of Acts is past. The things that they did is past, but not the new things of God. Every generation had acts concerning the book of Acts of the church. Now, verse 2 says, until the day in which he was taken up, after which the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles. So I want you to notice the word after in this verse. After what? After he was taken into heaven, he through the Holy Spirit gave commandments unto the apostles whom he has chosen. What well, Luke is saying is that the works of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus continue. He continues to work and teach, not only now and then, but through the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believer. The book of Acts of the Apostles is an open-end book. It continues to the present day, and it will continue until the Lord takes the church home. I want you to notice something also that is said here, the apostles whom he had chosen. Sometimes we look at the apostles of Jesus and we think, if only he would have chosen me like he chosen, chose them. Then I would feel special, then I would really do something great for God. When we look at the apostles, I want you to remind you of their lives. They were chosen by God. But so were you chosen by God to become the children of God, number one. To become the children of God. To have your name written in the book of life, that's number one. But God chose the apostles, and for three years he would minister to them. They would do miraculous things, or God would do miraculous things through their lives. But they would end up and be taught to be servants of all. They would be taught to be humble and meek and lowly. They'd be taught by Jesus, by example, that they were to wash the feet of people. And I personally believe that God does that to everyone. When Jesus calls us or chooses us to serve him in some capacity, He calls us to a lowly position. Why is that so important? I can't tell you how many stories I've read about people who are famous who have become Christians. And they are automatically put in the spotlight. And as they're in the spotlight for a period of time, they do well. But almost every single one of them in their life fall away from God, go back into their old lifestyle. And I think part of it is because of the pressure that is put upon them by people like you and me. I believe that God calls, and he calls us to lowly positions. I want to share with you just a little bit about my life, and I'm sure that all of you have this same thought in your own life if you've been walking with the Lord for a period of time. When I first became a Christian, I wanted to serve God whenever, in any capacity that God wanted me to serve. And usually that's what happens to every single Christian. 
when I talk with Dave or I talk with different people, their life is similar to mine in the sense of, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, God, no matter what it is, I will do it. So when God called me first, I decided that I was going to go to church, and I went to church, and I just so happened to go to a church that had all older people. Not old, older people. And when I went there, they were building a new sanctuary. And being the only one person, the only young couple there, my wife and I, they needed help to do gravel and cement and all these things that, okay, I was willing to do. So for the first six months of being a Christian, I was a laborer, a manual labor. You could have called me manual without a doubt. After that, the church was complete, the sanctuary. And I got a higher position. I worked in the nursery. <laughs> and you know what? I didn't mind doing that at all. I think we did that for six months to eight months, my wife and I. The babies were crying. They started growing. The church started growing some. And the, the babies were crying. And so I was the baby watcher, so to say. But then I got a higher position. I taught Sunday school, junior high. Boy, was that wonderful. I'm lying right now. It was probably one of the hardest things I've done, dealing with junior high. If you want to ask anybody about how junior high is in high school, talk to Dave Miner. But the junior high was an experience I'll never forget. Because you would share, and I'd share the gospel with them, and they'd look at you like... <laughs> or, and they'd say this to me, are we almost done yet? And I would say, no, we're not. We got another half hour. And what do you say to a junior high for an hour? And then I got moved up to the high school. Another wonderful thing. It was not easy. And then I got moved to a place where we call a deacon. And then I was an associate pastor. And then I became a senior pastor. But all through those processes, God reminded me to keep myself in a place of humbleness and brokenness and contriteness and keep myself in a place of willing to do whatever God would want me to do, no matter how big or how small it was. In other words, yeah, God, you chose me. Yes, God, you chose you. Every one of you, he chose you to do something for his kingdom. But to keep myself in a place and keep yourself in a place of God, I'm still willing to do anything you call me to do. I have a question for you because this question comes to my mind. If you're walking in the church parking lot and you see papers on the ground, what do you do? I know what you should do. Pick them up. But what do you do? If you see somebody that has a need and you happen to be busy, another Christian brother or a Christian sister, what do you do? That's keeping yourself in a place of where God wants you to be humble and meek. You should do whatever it needs to be done. If you see a toilet that needs to be plundered or a leak that needs to be fixed, what do you do? If it's at home, I fix it right away. So we see the apostles that are chosen by God and God chooses you and there's nothing better now, verse 3 says, To whom he also presented himself alive after suffering of many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he mentions here, Luke does, about the eyewitness accounts of those who saw Jesus after his resurrection. We remind you that 17 times he appeared to different people 
and the change that it made in their lives who had seen him. They were willing to die in their boldness, and they no longer feared death in any sense. I want you to notice something that's really important. It says here in the scripture that for 40 days, Jesus talked about the kingdom. Jesus was never at a loss for words because he was the word. But the teaching of the kingdom of God was one of the favorite subjects that Jesus spoke of. He was always talking about the kingdom of God and its great hope that he was planting into the hearts of all men. Things are not always going to continue corrupted as they are. The world is not going to go forever under the power of darkness, under the bondage of evil. God is going to one day establish his kingdom upon this earth, beloved. God promises. A kingdom of righteousness, joy, and peace. Jesus shall reign and his kingdom will extend from shore to shore. And that day will be the most glorious day the world has ever seen. As sickness and suffering and pain will be abolished in his kingdom. Sin and greed and these things that have made the world such an intolerable place will be abolished in his kingdom. The godless, commercialism, the exploitation of man, all of these things abolished in his glorious kingdom when he reigns. No wonder why the disciples were so anxious to see it come. When I look at our world today, I honestly feel like, God, come, please, Lord Jesus, come. Now, you may think, Pastor, you just want to escape. You know, you're partly right. There's so much evil in our world. I read of stories that blows my mind that people can be that evil and do those kind of things to other people. It's, it's a mind blower. It's so sickening. And then Jesus tells us about his kingdom and he tells us to pray. Remember what he says, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the right kind of desire that we should all have. I desire the kingdom of God. And so he was talking to them during those 40 days of the period about the kingdom of God. I want to read a scripture to you. This is in Revelations 21, verse 4, and it says this. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain from the former things have passed away. I believe personally that God puts in every single Christian heart a desire for the kingdom of God to come and even to pray for Verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them to depart from Jerusalem. I'm sorry, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he tells them to wait in a certain place, and not depart from Jerusalem. And then he talks about a thing called a promise. And the promise he's talking about literally is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says. Jesus said, wait here until Jerusalem, until you receive the promise of the Father. The promise that he is referring to is no doubt the promise in the book of Joel. Or the Lord promised, and he says it this, and it shall come to pass in the latter days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, your old men shall see visions, and upon my servants and my handmaidens shall I pour out my spirit, says the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. 
The day is coming when God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and all believers, he's saying. It hasn't happened yet. Now, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened to us. It has happened to us already. God always keeps his promises. When God makes a promise, it's going to happen in his time and in his way. It'll happen no matter what one says or thinks. The promise here is the Spirit of God coming into man and giving him the ability to do and to be who he is called to be, like Jesus. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Notice what it says here, which he has said that you have heard from me. I want to read a couple of scriptures that Jesus spoke to his disciples concerning the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, 37 through 39, it says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whose those believed in him would receive. For well, the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, during the, Lord's, or the Last Supper in John, it says this in John 14, 16 through 17. And I will pray to the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So it literally talks about the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it says that they will be totally submerged in the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you who the Holy Spirit is. He is a person. He is a third person of the Godhead or the Trinity. We'll talk more about him in just a second. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus totally skips over this question, and he doesn't even answer it. And this is what he says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and into Samaria and into the ends of the earth. So we have a threefold relationship with the Holy Spirit. From one, number one, he is with us prior to conversion. He is the one who causes you to realize that you are a sinner. He is the one who points to Jesus as the answer, as he convinces the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So every single person that is a non-believer, today if you are in this room and you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've never been born again, then the Holy Spirit is the one who's working in your heart, trying to reveal himself to you in the sense of who Jesus is, that you need a Savior. That's what he does to every non-Christian. Now, many of you have relatives who do not know God, who fight against God. Until their last breath, the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts trying to present Jesus to them. Once that last breath is taken, the Holy Spirit is removed and he's gone. The second one is part of the relationship with the Holy Spirit. The moment you open your life and your heart to Jesus Christ and you invite him in, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to indwell you. Jesus said this, he shall be in you. Know ye not that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. And know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. Be not drunk with wine in excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So we see that literally that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I invite Christ in, literally the Spirit of God comes into my life. So if you are a Christian today, and you know this already, every one of you have the Holy Spirit within them. If they're not, if he's not in there, you're not born again. Now, now there's a third relationship. This is an empowering experience. The Holy Spirit gives you and me a Christian as Christians, the ability to live for Jesus in this world. You know what God doesn't do? He doesn't do this. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to be. This is how I want you to act. This is, how you, this is all those things. Go out and do it. First of all, God asks us to do the impossible. But he gives us the Holy Spirit of God within us to be able to do that. This word power that is given to us is the same word we get that word dynamite for. Pretty powerful. It means strength, power, and ability. It gives us the ability to operate. He operates within us. The capability, or whatever that may be. So what you are lacking today, and me, this question comes to you, what are you lacking today? The Bible teaches you're not lacking anything. But let me tell you what will stop the power of God. God will never go against your free will, never. The Bible teaches that you can resist him, you can quench him, and you can grieve him. And there are many Christians today who are doing this same thing. The Holy Spirit tries to work in their hearts, tries to speak to them, tries to get them to do certain things that are going to help them and strengthen them. And they resist them or they say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm doing my own thing, so to say. They don't say in that words, they just say it by their actions. Notice what it says here. And you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world or the earth. And so the power is given to be a witness for Jesus Christ. The word witness in the Greek is the word martyrs, from where we get our word martyr. And in the Greek, it does mean martyr. A witness is one who not only proclaims what he believes, he lives what he believes. He is what he believes. And he believes it so strongly that if necessary, he'll die for what he believes. That's how strong is his belief. He is a martyr. You can't stop him. He's not afraid to die for what he believes. So this is why the Holy Spirit partly has been given to us. To be a witness out there in that world. To live the witness. That's what God has given you the Holy Spirit. There are so many people who think that the Holy Spirit's been given so I can speak tons or I can prophesy. I'm not saying that that isn't real. That can happen. That can be used. But that's not the main reason God gives the Holy Spirit. It's to be that witness. Every one of you as a Christian today is to be a witness for Christ. And if there's ever been a time as this, it is now. Everyone is out there in that world, and hopefully you're not, are scared. They're thinking about war, they're thinking about nuclear war, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the thing is, you have an opportunity to be a witness. But if you're silent, there's something wrong. If the Holy Spirit says, share this, something with somebody, and you're silent, there's something wrong. And it isn't with the Holy Spirit, it's with you. I don't do that no more. You don't do what no more? You no longer become a witness? The Holy Spirit no longer lives in you? Is that what you're saying? There's something wrong with that thought. It's contrary to the truth. Now, this word also means that I can martyr the old nature, the flesh. 
by the Holy Spirit. I was eating a sandwich the other day. And as I am eating, I always have an audience. And it's my fault. It's my fault. Let me tell you my thinking about dogs. And I can get you to think like me in just a second. Let me tell you how. How would you like it if every single day you got the same food? Every single meal. Kibble. Every day for the rest of your life, and you're going to live to be 14 years old, you're going to eat kibble and nothing but kibble. And beside it, you have water. So you eat water and kibble the rest of your life. How many of you would be happy and say, man, I love kibble? I mean, after a while, you just say, that's how I look at my dogs. I might shorten their lives by a few hours. <laughs> but let me tell you, they're going to be a lot more happy in getting what I give them. I give them part of my sandwich. I give them, part, I give them the end of my soup. I give them things that I, I give it to them to eat. So I've trained my dog to do this. So wherever I go, he follows me. His name is Toby. And everywhere I go, he follows me. Everywhere. And when I sit down to eat, he thinks he's supposed to eat. If my wife sits down and I'm eating, or I get finished eating, he goes to her and begs her. But she doesn't feed him. I do. So he constantly is wanting more. If one day I said to him, that's it. Go over and sit over there. And he walks over there and turns his butt around and does the eye look, the big brown eyes look at me like, come on, Dad. Have a heart. And I thought to myself, that's exactly how our flesh is. I could give my dog my sandwich, her sandwich, my soup, and, give him, and he would still have those same brown eyes. More, Dad, more, Dad. That's how our, our flesh is, beloved. Every single one of you's flesh is exactly the same. It's always wanting more. It can never be satisfied. But the Bible teaches that through the Holy Spirit, it can be reckoned dead. In other words, the old nature, the old fleshy nature, the sinful nature of what I want, how I want to be, attitudes, all those things, you know what I'm talking about, can be reckoned dead. But it can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. In N.A. and N.A., they make this statement. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once a drug addict, always a drunk addict. Jesus says differently. Once a new creation, always a new creation. Once need power to overcome, here's the Holy Spirit for every Christian. That's why the Bible teaches that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I say this, all that with this in mind. If there's ever been a time in our lives as Christians that we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to guide us and to lead us, to direct us, to teach us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, it's today. It's today, and you need him. Notice what it says here at the end of this verse, to be a witness unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice it says in home first that you're supposed to be a witness. In my house, I'm to be a witness. In my city, I'm to be a witness. In my neighborhood, I'm to be a witness. That's what the Bible teaches. And then we go beyond. You know, I've really been praying for Ukraine. And it's on the other side of the world. But I've just added that to my prayer list. It's something new I'm praying for. But I've been praying for things that are old a long time, such as my neighborhood, the people who live next door to me, the people who live across the street from me, I pray for them all the time because I want them to become to know Jesus. And that's part of the witness. 
but I also try to live my life as the way God wants me to be in our neighbors, with our neighbors. One of the things that we can do and hurt our witness is isolate ourselves. Let me ask you a question. How well do you know your neighbors? Oh, I know Fred across the street. I saw him six months ago. We talked. I don't think that's the witness God really wants us to be. He goes on, verse 11, 9 to 11. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up with the cloud, received him out of the sight, and while they looked steadfast toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them with white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So they literally see Jesus be taken up into heaven. And as they're looking up into heaven, two angels speak to the disciples and say, why do you keep looking? Guess what? Jesus is going to come back the same way, and everyone's going to see him. Two thoughts concerning this. The first one is, all the saints are going to see him because they're going to be coming back in the clouds with him, number one. Number two, every person on this earth, which we now have the technology to do for the first time in the history of mankind, will be able to see Jesus when he comes back. And we finish this teaching in in verse 12. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. So it says they continued in one accord. It means one mind, one passion. A unique Greek word used 10 of us 12 times in the New Testament occurs in the book of Acts helps us to understand the uniqueness of the Christian community. Hamatunamadon is a compound of two words meaning to rush along and in unison. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded which, while different, harmonize in pitch and tone. As the instruments of a great concert under the direction of a concert master, so the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of members of Christ Church. I want to put this in a, a short truth concerning this. God calls every kind of person from every walk of life. He gifts them, gives them talents, and they play part of the body of Christ. And they harmonize and become one instead of indifferent or separate. Every single person in this church that is a Christian is part of you. That's how it works. They're part of the family of God. You're part of the family of God. And you play a, a part. Now, let me give you a little illustration. Part of you may, one of you may be a tuba. One of you may be a saxophone. One of you may be a flute. One may be a drum. I don't know what you are. But you know one thing. When God brings it all together, it's beautiful. And there's nothing like it. And that's how these disciples were and how they became. And that's how the body is supposed to be, the body of Christ. That's how the church is supposed to be. And I believe that God's doing that. Father, we are grateful for your many blessings today. We thank you for the word of God. We ask God for each one to be renewed concerning the Holy Spirit, to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit, God. We pray, Lord, that you would unfill and make yourself known, Lord, by the Spirit of God, by the power of God. And Father, any who are weak this morning, and that's all of us, Lord God, I'm asking that you'd refill us, Lord God, that we'd become more dependent on you 
And Father, we would hear what the Spirit of God would say to us this morning, Lord God. Father, we want to ask that you would forgive us if we have grieved you or quenched you or resisted your Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord God. And there's ever been a time, Lord, that we need to depend on you and trust you. It's now, Lord God. It's now. So fill us, Father. Equip us. Enable us. And Father, may we be a witness, Lord God. Like only you can make us, Lord God. That we may bring glory and honor and praise to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Okay, stay seated this morning. I'm going to have a little bit of a question and answer time. Let me share with you what I think is happening in our world today. First of all, nobody has every answer. I search out different men that I trust, and I try to see where they're coming from after I've talked to the Lord about things that are happening. And I haven't found a lot of information, to be honest with you, concerning what's happening in our world today. What's going on with Russia and Ukraine? The possibility. Doesn't mean that it's happening. There's a possibility that God is putting a hook in the jaw of Russia, Gog. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, they're talked about a world war that will happen, that God will literally put a hook into the jaw of Gog, which is the leader of Russia, Magog being Russia, and he will pull them down, and where he'll pull them down is to Israel. It is possible that's what God is doing, but if that's to happen, there's a great possibility also that Russia will be, go, be going further into other nations, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Poland, all those other nations too, they'll be going into them and they'll be pulling them down with him. Today in Syria, which is right across from Israel, close to Israel, the Russians have many troops and have planes and different things that they can attack Israel from. The Bible teaches that that's exactly what's going to happen. When God does pull Russia down, they're going to go after Israel, and they're going to go after Israel for booty, okay? That's what the scripture says. That means for their wealth. And the wealth that Israel now has, just a coincidence that Russia is a supplier, number, or tries to supply the whole world. They want to. They're doing Europe right now with gas and oil. But Israel, in the last year or so, has just found more, they say, than anywhere in the world, gas and oil. That may be what's pulling, what may pull them down, or God may use that hook to get that. Now, there's not a lot more to really say about that. concerning what's happening. Russia has said that they are getting ready. They didn't say they're going to shoot off, but you probably have read an article about they are ready to unleash nuclear bombs. There are people that are saying that there's a possibility that this may be World War III. I don't know. Nobody knows. But I do know this. Things are not falling apart. They're falling into place. God knows what he's doing, and God sits on the throne. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And nothing is allowed to happen outside of the plan and the purpose of God. There's no accidents as Christians. There's fact that God said, I'm allowing this for a reason. And let me tell you what I believe God's trying to do with us. Make us witnesses, like I shared earlier. We need to be witnesses. Number two, God wants us to trust him no matter what we see, no matter what's going on. We need to trust God. Don't go on your feelings and don't allow fear to grip your heart because there's a lot of fear out there, beloved. And again, you know this. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So with that being said, does anybody want, have any questions? Does, does anybody want a question? Have a, maybe I can answer a question. If you don't have one, I'm okay with that. Okay, there's no question then. You're all okay with this? Okay. Let me say this to you. I want to encourage you to come to Wednesday night's Bible study. I know some of you can't. You can't drive at night. I understand that. But we are in the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations literally says to us what's happening and what's going to happen in the future. God knows the future. So I encourage you, if you want to learn and be more settled in what's happening concerning the future, what God said is going to happen, then please come to Wednesday night's study. It's a wonderful study. God will bless you. He promises. Matter of fact, he says, blessed are those who read this scriptures, who reads the revelations, who studies the Re book of revelations. So I want to encourage you with that, okay? Let's stand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. After I pray, don't take off. We want to sing one song, okay? Father, we want to thank you for being our God. And we want to thank you for your presence here this morning, Lord God. Father, we want to remind you, Lord God, of your promises. You've made, Father, a promise to us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, we've all experienced this in our life, Lord God. No matter what's gone on, you've been there, Lord God. I want to thank you, Lord, that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord God. We want to thank you that you sit on the throne, Lord, that you are in control, Lord God. And Father, I'm asking this morning that you would dissolve any kind of fear that would be in the hearts of your people, Lord, no matter what it may be, whether it be in the wor world circumstances, whether it be, Father, about life, whether dealing with a sickness, Lord, whatever it may be. I'm asking that you would remove any kind of fear, Lord, and you replace that fear with your love, Lord God. I want to thank you for being the God of hope, Lord God. We're not hopeless, Lord. You are God, and you're the only one. So we thank you for that, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that you remove any confusion or disorder from the hearts of your people. And put peace that surpasses understanding and may the peace of God rule their hearts like you say in Colossians 3.15, Lord. Let the peace of God rule their hearts. Again, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives us in us, equips us, Lord God. Enables us, Lord. He's the power that we need, Lord God. So help us to stand on that, Father, ability, in that ability that you've given each of us as Christians, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being the God that we serve. What an awesome God we serve. I want to tell you, last but not least, Lord, that we love you. And we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to go through anything without you. Bless your people now, Lord, and as we sing, may our hearts be grateful to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. We'll have people up here. Pastors, Don will be over here, and I'll be over here. If you need prayer this morning, please come up and get prayer. If you want to come up to the altar and kneel and pray, Dave will be up here also on the corner. If you want to come up and kneel before the Lord and talk to the Lord and pray, please do. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.
time Free at last he has ransomed me His grace runs deep While I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me Yes, he died for me Amen, amen. That's what we have in common together is Jesus. And he sets us free. He's the Prince of Peace. Take his peace with you as we leave. Amen. Amen.